Zero. This conference will now be recorded. Caller zero zero, we're going to have to put you on mute since we can't get an identification. If you find that you have input you want to give, you'll need to identify yourself later on. But uh, we will be putting you on a mute status until we have you identified. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, uh, October 12th, 2021 Town of Asher Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Um, we will start with the seating of alternates. Um, the one alternate we have is Doug Jen, Jenny, and he will be seated for Jerry Dufresne. Okay. Uh, in reviewing, moving on, re reviewing the approval of minutes from mm -hmm. the September 13th, 20, 2021 regular meeting. Uh, do I have uh, a uh, need for discussion, a motion to approve? Motion to approve, Jeff. Okay, that came from Jeff Schillinger. I'll second, mm -hmm. Alex. Second for Alex Estillo. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those Jeff, opposed? Uh, yes. I abstain since it wasn't. And, and abstention. I, I abstain. Janet. So we have Thanks. Janet and Richard abstaining. Valerie? Yes. And motion passes. Okay. Um, we do have public comment listed in our meeting. I have a feeling most of the people here are uh, going to be speaking towards the public hearing that we also have on the schedule, but I do offer it up to any general public comments regarding. Uh, the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission and its efforts. And hearing none at this time, we'll move on to uh, bills. Alex, anything for bills? No, I don't have any bills right now. No bills. And moving on to correspondence. Um, we do I have said, a. I sent out the Krog uh, monthly and a letter to be read during the public hearing. Okay. And I need to go find something here. Bear with me one second. And there. And got it. And here, no, it's oops, Krog stuff I have. And here we go. Okay, um, we did send out the letter that uh, Alex uh, mentions, which is the letter from Robinson and Cole on behalf of uh, Mr. Uh, Robert Michelle from uh, Camper Lane. Um, so, uh, and it will have discussion, further discussion along that in the hearing itself. So we'll hold off on that correspondence, though it, again, it has been sent out to all the commission members for review prior to the uh, meeting this evening. Uh, as for the CROG information, uh, pertinent to us, uh, actually pertinent to us, let's see, um, there's the one from Willington Planning and Zoning, which was a proposed zoning amendment pertaining to temporary moratorium on cannabis establishments. Uh, receipt was acknowledged by CROG, and uh, they found no apparent conflicts with regional plans and policies or the concerns of neighboring towns. And again, we received that due to being a neighboring uh, community to uh, Willington. Uh, we also received, which happened to be another one from another town uh, from Krog, it has it's uh, East Granby planning and zoning with the same proposed zoning amendment pertaining to the prohibition of retail sale of recreational cannabis. Again, finding no apparent conflicts there. Um, there are a number of other ones, uh, one pertaining to zoning amendment to site development plan requirements for a floodplain that was out in Canton. 
not really pertinent to us. Uh, another one for Canton, which was district boundaries for the Farmington River protection overlay. Again, not pertinent to us. Um, and uh, proposed zoning amendment pertaining to new housing opportunity zone and accompanying standards. That was from Avon and no apparent conflicts there, along with uh, uh, the CROG staff commending the uh, efforts surrounding affordable multifamily housing in Avon. And the last one is a plan from Southington, a proposed zoning amendment pertaining to opting out of parking maximum and accessory dwelling requirements. Um, this was uh, reviewed by the staff um, where they found no conflicts with concerns to neighboring towns. However, the proposed opt out of providing accessory dwelling units conflicts with multiple policies of their regional plan of conservation and development. And as it, as it particularly relates to the goals of increasing the range of choice in housing. Um, they, if, particularly if the town has not yet completed its affordable housing plan for section 80-30J, um, staff would encourage the town to consider CROG's sustainable land use model code for accessory dwelling units. So again, something we've touched upon in the past and just what's going on in some of the other towns, uh, both near us and outside of our true area. Again, CROG has a huge, huge coverage area of uh, 10, 20, 30 or 40 towns that they deal with. Uh, Ashford yeah. not being one of them. We are under yeah. NECOG. Um, we've asked for NECOG's uh, input on a couple of items, and uh, we'll be able to discuss those later on also as to whether we receive that or not. Uh, I believe that's it for court. Yes. Yeah. What was the rationale of going out to Krug for their input? Because we're not part of Krug. Uh, a lot of the towns you just mentioned are, you know, almost an hour drive from here. So, you know, why would we be seeking their uh, input on on the, what we're doing? It's not a matter of seeking input. It looks like it came out as a package of all on October 8th of uh, Krog letters. And um, I will ask, I'll ask Michael. Michael, did we go out and grab these or were they sent to us as a package? So um, we are obligated by state statute to submit everything that we do to Krog because we border Krog towns. So we submit to NECOG and to Krog. Krog has right. a regional planning commission meeting once a month that they refer, that they review all text amendments and then they submit all of their comments to all of the people that submitted requests and all member towns. So those communications okay. go out to everybody. Okay, so again, the first couple that I mentioned were pertinent to us, at least, at least the first one was regarding Willington. Um, and it's uh, 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 proposed amendment for temporary moratorium on cannabis establishments. The others were just, um, actually we could even not have those into the record simply because, but we did receive those from Krog. Thank you for the question, Richard, appreciate it. Okay, moving on. Uh, we will now enter the uh, public hearing phase of our meeting. Uh, I'll be reading the legal notice. Uh, Town of Ashford Planning and Zoning Commission, Ashford Town Office Building, uh, really as a virtual meeting, as it says, 5 Town Hall Road, Ashford, Connecticut. The Ashford Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a virtual public hearing on Tuesday, October 12th at 7 p.m. to consider the following applications. I will read all three of these into the record so that Excuse you don't have me, to go Jeff. individually. Excuse yes. me, Jeff. I just got a call from Jerry Dufresne. He's trying to log on. He's tried the phone number and everything. He can't seem to get on to meeting. He keeps on getting a report that the meeting hasn't started. I don't know how we can help him. He's tried to call in on the phone number also? He's tried to call in. He's tried to log on and he can't seem to get on. Michael, refresh my memory on the rules for a member trying to get in electronically with our virtual system. I, I got an email about a, 10 minutes ago from saying that somebody was trying to join the meeting using last month's link. Oh, because so, we're on GoToMeeting now, right? Not Zoom? We're on GoTo, but I, if he was accessing the nine, sound like he, someone was trying to get in on the September meeting link, so he needs to use the link on the current agenda. Um, so let me All see. Right. 
Let me. I'll try calling him and see if I can get him to try on to double check what he's trying to get on. I will email him. I will email him the uh, the agenda link. Okay. And we are bat batting the zero tonight, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Slow. Okay. Nineteen. All right, I'm going to try calling him, too. Okay. Okay, we have a caller 01 that's entered also. Um, could you identify yourself? Someone who just called in? Yep, this is Carolyn and Rob Trotter at 22 Lakeside Drive. Carolyn and Rob? Yep, Trotta. Trotta. T R O T T A. Yep. Carolyn, Thank you very much. What, what is the Rob. man's name? Rob. Robert. 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 Trotta, T R O T T A. Right, okay. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, uh, Michael. Yep. You still working on it? Well, I sent it over to him, but. Okay, great. All right, so we will move forward. So again, as I was reading into the record, and what I was saying is that we'll read through the entire um, hearing notices, and um, well, we'll do it one at a time because it is each one is a separate hearing. So our first notice is uh, PZ two one dash four special permit application per article. 4B, Section 3A, I think 19. I try calling Jerry, and I keep on getting a busy signal, so he must be trying to log on. Okay. Again, uh, Section 3, uh, Article 4B, Section 3A, 19C, for a short-term rental at Seven Oak Drive, um, a.k.a. Map 54, Lot 252, applicant being Nicole Smiros. Um, so that is our first hearing. Um, all of the members have been forwarded the uh, application information, which I have to say, even on the record, I'm very impressed with the thoroughness of everything, Nicole. Um, it's uh, thank you. I, I had some... sorry. I had some help. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, just a couple of things um, to set the tone on the hearings, and this will hold for all the hearings. Uh, Mike, can you shut the chat room off? Yep. Okay, so no no information will move through the chat room, so there'll be no sidebars, no ex parte discussions, uh, digitally or otherwise. Um, we ask that uh, you remain muted unless you want to speak or your time comes to speak for comment. Uh, you can either raise your hand digitally or in the picture here if you're online uh, and ask to speak or speak up to ask to speak also if you're not digitally on. Um, uh, when you do speak, please indicate your name and address for recording purposes. And uh, comments are to be directed to the, I'm saying the commission, it should be to the chair, but you'll be talking to the commission anyways, but keep your, keep, keep your comments to the chair. There will not be a question and answer period amongst the attendees. The members of the board may ask questions of the applicant. Uh, but uh, again, it's a uh, very simple back and forth. We are limiting comments of the applicant to five minutes uh, or any comment from any of the public to more than, no more than five minutes. And uh, that's five in total. So if it goes uh, to one set of comments and then another statement needs to be made, the total will be five minutes. Uh, and again, members may ask clarifying questions of the applicants or the uh, correspondence. So that being said, um, Nicole, do you want to give us a short synopsis of uh, your proposal? Uh, though, again, it's very well laid out in our document here. Um, um, just please, basically go ahead. what I have in my um, letter to the, the commission, um, looking to short rent property 
um, self-managing it, and I'm there just about uh, once a week, um, do, taking care of the lawn maintenance and things like this. Um, plan to be quite restrictive, probably to my detriment, um, on who is allowed to rent. We're not going to allow any parties, um, no more than two adults um, at, at any given time. Um, we'll be implementing um, other kind of tools to help us know there's a party. Our goal is to not disturb the neighbors around us. We really like this spot. We're hoping that one day it becomes a spot that we're going to all the time and not having to rent it out. Um, so we want to do what we can to keep our neighbors happy with us and, and not not looking to shut us down. Um, anyway, I've been uh, making good friends with uh, one of the ladies across the street who uh, has been helping out, giving me pointers, things like this. So I'm, I'm actually quite excited and, and I'm hoping this this uh, is approved and, and I can move forward. I've been doing a lot of work on the house and trying to make sure that it, it's uh, safe and, and, and accessible for whoever is going to rent it. Okay. Um. I have just a quick couple of questions. Do you have any, uh, I guess I'm asking to clean off your crystal ball. Do you have any idea of uh, what you expect to be length of rentals for the short term? Are they going to be you weekly, know, couple weeks, even up to a month or something? Well, I don't really want to do a month long, um, mostly because I, I'm then afraid of it carrying out and becoming some sort of a long term situation. Um, looking at a, a minimum stay of probably about three days. Um, we, we're still we're, we're going to have to post and see what kind of um, uptake we get depending on, on what our what we put in there. But we look to we're looking to start with a, a three day minimum. Um, not sure what a maximum would be. I don't know what the rules would be on a maximum. But for myself personally, I don't really want somebody there, you know, more than a month. Um, also, because then I, I I have another rental property and, and um, it when things are long term things start to fall through the cracks and and I don't want that to happen. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other question I have you have a list of names in your application here, including your application packet, um, and I just didn't see what those were in reference to. The names that was the abutters list, and and to be honest. Um, when I got home and pulled it up myself, I wasn't quite sure if I did it correctly. Um, I put in the parameters on the the government website saying that it needed to be, um, you know, two, uh, all all abutters within 200 feet of um, the unit, and this was generated from that that website. So, okay. uh, you know, some of them I don't know how close they <laughs> they are um, to the property. I don't know if it was, um, you know, they're kind of not caring. Um, and then some of them looking at the addresses, I know exactly where they are. Um, but yeah, this this was generated. I, I forgot the name of the website that I used, but um, this was generated from through the Connecticut government website. This yeah, that came from the NECOG GIS. So we generate the abutters list as required. It's going the the list, the mailing labels that it gets generated are. That's the mailing address of the property owner, so that's why it doesn't necessarily reflect the physical address, because a lot of the people in the lake area are not full time there. Okay. Right. Of that list, only two um, letters were returned to me. Um, one for, and I knew this was going to happen because it didn't make sense. The address for a Grant Elaine Life Use, uh, Grant Michael and Laura clearly not a complete address, um, so that was returned. And then another for a Miss Mora Nelly, um, who seems to reside in Manchester. So I don't know which unit um, she would be, but somewhere within the 200 feet. This, These are the two that were, were returned to me. I had mailed these out um, before the end of September, so um, I would imagine if there were any others coming back, uh, this is it already then. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Again, I don't know if it was a, a petition, if it was uh, letters of support or what it was. So thank mail, you. Mail them their copy of the legal notice so yep. that they had their chance yep. to speak. Right. Okay. Um, those were the only questions I had at this time. Um, does the uh, any other commission members have any questions regarding this? 
Yeah, Jeff, this is Dick. Um, I would ask M Mark and Janet to weigh in on how this application and use uh, fits with what they had developed for the uh, uh, land use regulations concerning this. The, the uh, short-term rental regulations were designed to avoid any situation where large numbers of um, houses became short-term rentals and um, the neighborhood was no longer a real neighborhood with, with people who live there. Um, and it does require that um, the owner be in residence. Mark? I, I agree with Janet. That was the intent. Okay. Um, and actually, we can do this discussion um, as opposed to um, questions of the applicant uh, during our meeting under unfinished business and get into more detail. Um, so I'm really looking for anything specific to uh, uh, Ms. Marinos' uh, application and uh, request. Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, I am looking for a, a motion to um, accept, uh, I'm sorry, receive um, the application so that we can move forward with discussion as unfinished business in our meeting. Janet, I'll so move. Second, Jeff. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstentions? Okay, so what's really gone on, uh, Mr. Marinos, is that we have um, approved the receipt of your application. So we'll have further discussion at our meeting following the hearing um, and uh, go from there. Uh, you're more okay. than welcome, obviously, to stay on, or um, you know, you can check with Mike. Uh, tomorrow with the uh, results of that meeting. I, I think I'll stay on. Thank you. That's fine. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. OK, moving on. Uh, the second item or the second hearing. Oh, excuse me. Let me close that hearing uh, for the um, first item of the special permit application and open the second hearing. Uh, which is the proposed text amendment, a new text amendment of Article 4F Lake District to establish specific zoning regulations for properties within the Ashford Lake and Lake Chafee areas. Applicant is the Ashford Planning and Zoning um, and uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. I got a typo in there. So, uh, so what we've done to, for those of you that are on the phone, we had a goal. And our goal regarding this was to provide structure uh, to a situation that is pretty much unstructured and uh, non-conforming. Uh, again, our goal, let me just find my notes here. Okay, here we go. Um, Our goal was to give, uh, as I said, structure to some of the areas in and around the lake, developments that have been longstanding and don't really fit into, well, let me put it this way, the regulations that are currently out there for our identified zones have a very difficult, uh, property owners have a very difficult time uh, fitting into those requirements. Uh, so it makes a number of the lots both non-conforming as well as the need to basically seek variances and going to the Zoning Board of Appeals um, to try and get um, uh, changes made to allow development of their um, lots. And uh, we felt that that wasn't necessarily a fair situation for the lake owners. Um, 
we also were looking to curb um, uh, wastewater and water runoff in the area into the lakes to preserve um, the uh, natural habitat and the beauty and the uh, again the uh, lake uh, to better control the lake and protect a very natural special resource the lake resources in around there so um to that end we've come up with the in working with the commission and with uh our zoning enforcement officer we came up with a relatively simple uh set of regulations that article 4f for the lake district we have run them by the two uh lake district uh associations for input and prior to that, we actually reached out to Lake residents with a survey that uh, we developed internally uh, to gain input onto what was the important matters that we should be dealing with. And thus you see some of the things dealing with um, uh, both permitted uses, um, maintaining a, a method for uh, preserving the, uh, the lake properties themselves and the resource that they are, as I said earlier. And uh, uh, also just some general standards that allow for some control by the commission when it comes to lot size and runoff and impervious surface. So uh, that being said, uh, I don't know if the commissioners have anything further they would like to add to that opening statement regarding our regs. Well, I just like to say, as, as um, Jeff mentioned, um, we did take into consideration the um, results from the surveys, and um, water quality was one of the top um, concerns of, of residents around both lakes. Thank you, Janet. Anyone else on the commission? Okay, uh, we will open it up to uh, public comment. Uh, again, we ask that your comments be limited to approximately five minutes. Um, is there anyone who would like to speak to um, the uh, Lake District uh, regulations as proposed? Yeah, I would like to speak, if I may. Yes, Mr. Robert, Michelle. Robert, Robert Michelle. Uh, I, I actually was hoping to speak for a little longer than five minutes. Uh, I didn't know it was a five minute limit. I, I was thinking I would talk for five to eight minutes. Uh, but because of that, I will try and sort of speed up a little bit in the remarks that I've got. Um, First of all, I, I want to say that the Commission has done a really excellent job on addressing the concerns that they uh, expressed in the survey they did and so on and so forth. I, you know, obviously, I, I've thought very deeply about uh, the proposed regulations and uh, I, I must have gone through some of the tortuous tracks that, that you guys on the Commission went through and uh, came across the same types of difficulties and hoops to jump through and so on and so forth and i fully realize how difficult these this, this set of decisions was uh to come up with the regulations that you came up with and so i i had my uh, congratulations to you for these regulations i'm strongly in favor of them uh, of the of the regulations themselves uh, and the intent uh, I just have a, a, a few comments about things that I'm. Um, I got a, uh, some areas of concern, and uh, you have a letter from uh, me and my lawyer about what those areas of concern are, and I'm just going to summarise them now. Uh, I, I feel first that they don't really go far enough to protect water quality. Uh, uh, I, I feel that. Uh, some non-conformities are going to be created, which is contrary to the intent of uh, your regulations. And I feel that the height limit doesn't provide an exception for solar structures, which uh, I think uh, there should be a special permit process for that. So I'm gonna talk about all three of those um, 
areas a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, that I found out when I started looking at the science of uh, runoff was that hydrologists in general talk about uh, limit, you know, limiting impervious surfaces to 10 to 12% of the whole drainage. And my problem with these regulations are they only apply to the lake association's um, uh, sphere of action. In other words, only part of the drainage. And in fact, there's, there's, there's four very significant parts of the drainage into, now I'm talking about Ashford Lake. I'm not talking about Lake Chafe. I, I, sh I should add that very quickly. I, I have no, uh, no input at all about Lake Chafe. But there are four areas of drainage that go into Ashford Lake. One of them is along North Road. Uh, another is down Campert Lane. Another is Lakewoods Lane. And then something we can't really do much about, that is the Eastford side of the lake, uh, over which Ashford has no jurisdiction at all. And one of the things that came out of discussions between uh, Mike and, and my lawyer and which I only learned about last week is this concept of an overlay zone. And what I'd like to suggest is that to take care of these other drainages into the lake and try and control those as well as the drainage from our own properties in the Ashford Lake Association is to cre create some overlay zone. And the way my lawyer put it, he said either in lieu of the regulations you're proposing or in addition to the regulations to try and uh, deal with these uh, other properties uh, and the, a lot of those properties are large properties and, and, and I'd like to give a, a few examples if you take one of the small properties on Ashford Lake itself these are lots that are 120 by 60 feet basically that's 7200 square feet you take 10 percent of that which is your impervious surface limit you come up with seven you come up with 720 square feet uh, and 700, if you've got a house at 720 square feet on a small lot with a small house like that, you've already got a non-conforming lot. So this is this is creating a non-conformity and it's making it, uh, uh, you know, difficult for someone to make small changes like putting a garden path or a porch or something like that onto their lot. So there are, in my view, there's some real difficulties for people with small lots. Uh, and then if you look at a very large lot, and I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of those lots that are not in the Lake Association, these are the lots in the places I just mentioned. Uh, that let's say we've got a two acre lot of 88,000 square feet, 10% of that is 8,800 square feet. And 8,800 square feet, uh, I, I don't know whether, you know, how much you feel about these numbers. I, I, I feel 8,800 square feet is a huge amount of impervious surface. I mean, I've got a lot of impervious surface around my own property, and uh, it's nowhere near 8,800 square feet. And I, I, I believe that it's, it's just too much to give large property owners, as of right, the ability to put in impervious surfaces. So I think there should be a stricter limit on large lots than there is on small lots. And that's the, the main, uh, this, uh, not disagreement, the main perturbation I would like to see in these regulations is to try and address that difference between large lots and s small lots. I know it's, uh, it goes against the simplicity that you would like, uh, but I think it's important in order to not discriminate against people with small lots. Um, Uh, the, the, the address, addressing the non-conformities that were before my own, I have a one third acre lot, which the, my house is on, and that's going to be immediately non-conforming as soon as these regulations are put in at the 10% level. I've got over 10% of impervious surface. I've also got a solar structure on my property, which makes me non-conforming again uh, for, for, um, uh, for, for, my, for my particular lot. So uh, one of the things that uh, I learned last week was that the median size of lots around the lake are 0.4 acres. And uh, the, the lawyer, my lawyer and I came up with this idea that uh, properties greater than 0.4 acres be subject to a stricter rule than properties 
less than 0.4 acres. And I, I hesitate to suggest numbers. I know these numbers are difficult and uh, I know that you've talked about them a lot in the past and I, I wouldn't presume to try and to demand any particular types of numbers, but the sort of numbers that, that I've thought through is lots that are greater than four acres. You should uh, come up with a, 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 a uh, an impervious surface limit of somewhere in the five to ten percent range. In other words, more stringent than you that you're suggesting right now. And properties properties less than 0.4 acres, uh, subject to a 15 or 20 percent range. Now this gives more flexibility to the smaller lots and restricts the larger lots without uh, taking away either communities as of right to do small projects around their properties. And if you take uh, an average of 5 to 10 percent and 15 to 20 percent, you come up with about 10 percent, which is what hydrologists generally suggest for drainage into a lake. So uh, that, that's fundamental. Now you, you can go uh, the, the low impact design, you can set a level for that. So for, for, for uh, large lots, you could go to 20 percent subject to special permit and low impact design and for uh, smaller lots you could go to 30 percent subject to uh, low impact design or something like that and as i say these are only uh, broad suggestions i don't have the depth of insight that, that you have but i do think that they would address some of these uh, inequalities in between small lots and large large lots now on the the solar structures thing uh i'm, I'm really strongly in favor of you know, preventing the lake view being blocked. I think anybody who lives around a lake is going to worry about that. And so uh, the, 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 the height regulation I'm strongly in favor of, but there are some situations where a solar structure above the height regulation that you're talking about uh, is suitable. And uh, the, the one I've put up on my property does not block anybody's view. It's uh, shielded by trees uh, to the north and west. Uh, it, it's, it's very innocuous in many ways. Uh, I, I think I might have one neighbor that, that gets, sees it more than other neighbors, but it's not blocking any lake view and so on. And there are technical reasons why it was a good idea to do that uh, solar structure. So uh, I, I do believe that uh, if you put in a, a blanket, height regulation it will just block solar structures and make a person go to the variance commission to get a solar structure of that height and uh, i've been to the variance commissions for solar structures and uh, you can't show a hardship it's not possible in my view to show a hardship for a solar structure and uh, so that means in my view that there ought to be a special permit process for a solar structure and that process will ensure that there are good technical reasons for a, a, a solar structure of such a height and that it doesn't block anybody's view of the lake and, and so on and so forth. You can come up with a whole bunch of considerations for something like that. Uh, so in summary, uh, impervious surface regulation does not protect the whole lake. It only protects that little bit by the lake association lots. Uh, and it's consequently unfair to small lot owners. And I think the regulation should be a little bit more complicated in order to take care of that situation. And I suggest there'll be slightly different regulations for impervious surfaces above and below 0.4 acres, the median size of lots uh, within the lake association. And I, I suggest uh, you provide a special per permit process for solar poles. Okay, that's my uh, summary of basically what, what we said, what my, the lawyer uh, of mine said and, uh, in the letter that I sent to the, the commission. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Michelle. And uh, excellent job in summation, some quite a bit of information that uh, you had provided. So again, I thank you for keeping very close to the time limit. Uh, uh, do we have any other um, input from uh, the visitors to the hearing? Any clarifying questions of the commission of uh, Mr. Michelle's uh, statement?
not to go into long uh, dissertation. Again, we will discuss at the meeting, but do you have anything to you'd like clarified? This is Carolyn Trotta. I'd like to say something. Yes. Yes, go ahead, um, Carolyn. Yeah. Again, um, I'm uh, 22 Lakeside Drive on Ashford Lake, and I'd, I'd like to um, to re reiterate what um, Mr. Michel said on um, one, one point um, with the runoff from other properties that aren't members of the association. Um, there's a lot of properties that have higher elevation and we do get a lot of runoff, especially Campert Lane washes out all the time down into the lake area that's caused um, a lot of um, issues for us out down over by Farm Drive. Um, so definitely, I would like to see some type of overlay district, um, anybody within our watershed that does run off, that, um, that there be something to um, take care of um, the runoff into our lake. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom Barry. Mr. Barry. Yes. Uh, I'm Tom Barry. I live at 42 Farm Drive. I'm actually reside in Eastford, but I'm president of the uh, Lake Association. And, and the comments I'm going to make now are personal rather than on behalf of our board of directors. Um, which has not taken a formal position on any of this because we haven't had adequate input from enough members to be confident that anything that we say would represent uh, the views of the entire community. But I would like to uh, support what uh, Bob, Michelle, and uh, Carolyn have just said with regard to the overlay area. And uh, also with regard to the different percentages depending on lot size. I hadn't, we hadn't talked about that. I didn't see that till I saw the letter, but I think that's quite reasonable and should be uh, considered. Um, as far as the drainage of an area that extends outside the boundaries of the actual Lake Association, we do have a very serious issue at the north end uh, involving Campert, uh, it's Campert Lane. We have a Campert Drive, but Campert Lane is the town road. And I've been kind of dealing with this with uh, different select persons and the public works for a while now, and no remedy has uh, been taken. Um, it's a combination of the of the drainage, but it's also a f has to do with the actual uh, the drainage system that is carrying water to the lake um, more directly in many instances than some of our own drainage systems. So, you know, briefly, I, w I would support what the uh, Carolyn and and Bob have said on those two points. And I would uh, encourage uh, investigating the overlay concept to uh, address what is an obviously serious drainage issue coming from the town road on Campert Lane. Excuse me, yes. is this Campers Lane or Campert Lane? Campert, C-A-M-P-E-R-T. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Mr. Berry. You're welcome. Um, other this comments? Is, this is more uh, for Mike, but it's, it touches on this concept of an overlay. Uh, Mike, you would be proposing a potential for an overlay for some of these lots like off Campert Lane that are not part of the Ashford Lake uh, Association where they are generating significant runoff. So those lots outside that area of, of the Ashford Lake Property Association would be subject to the overlay. Is, is that correct? Are you, are you talking to me, Vic? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, so, I, I'm looking for some clarification yeah, as to yeah. what you'd mean by the overlay. 
Yeah, the only way that we could overlay zones can only be more restrictive. And so we can't flip this to an overlay and and solve all of the other zoning modifications that we're proposing. So um, to, we would have to develop an overlay, which basically fit all of the properties which contribute runoff in some way to these lakes. And as, as was mentioned, because one of the lakes is not completely in Ashford, we would have only limited control, but we'd have to we'd have to model the topography to figure out the total extent of what those properties were. Um, but it would, but again, an overlay zone would still ultimately be a regulation, which means it would not retroactively address any existing situations related to impervious coverage or, or runoff or, or any of those things. It would only deal with activity moving forward. Right. And this would be primarily focused on the larger lots that are outside of the Ashford Lake Property Association. It would it would ultimately encompass probably everything. So, I mean, I guess we could have it butt up to where the zone that you're considering tonight begins, um, or we could create two areas and have this the overlay be consistent with what we've got written here. We looked. I looked at some overlay zones early on when we were looking at Coventry and Lebanon and Marlboro and some of the other towns that have these Lake District type situations and. We, we, I think the commission's sense at the time was that we wanted to have an incremental approach and not make, not add a five or $10,000 engineering bill to, to every application. And that's why we kind of moved in this direction, but we can certainly, we can certainly start that process if the commission's interested. So the idea of an overlay would not preclude moving forward with what's on the table right now? Nope, it would just be an additional layer on top of that that would be more expansive geographically. Thank you for that clarification, Mike. Um, any other comments from uh, the public or uh, any clarifying questions from the commission? Um, yeah, this is Jan. I have a question for Mike. Um, you mentioned doing a topographical study. Is it um, fairly obvious what the drainage, what areas would be included in the drainage? Um, I suspect that most of the data um, exists through the various GIS either available with clear the state or or what we have locally what we have to do is compare yeah if there's water bodies like rivers or streams the topography and then the third step for us to be able to figure out exactly what we want to do and where we will draw on the map would be to take that in information and marry it with our parcel information our assessors maps to show actually what parcels are, are within it um, so it's not overly complicated, but it's not something that, that can be done, you know, in, a, in, in a couple of days. Um, but I, but I think the, the information exists in various locations. We just kind of got to compile it. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, can I make just one very brief comment? I, to me, the, this 10% regulation on the small lot owners is, is uh, very serious. And uh, so I, I urge caution in going ahead with your present regulations as is without modification. Uh, better to delay and look at this overlay stuff and, and so on. Uh, before making final decisions, because I, I, I suspect that some of the study of the overlay concept may affect uh, your ideas about what you would do about lots around the Ashford Lake Association as well. So um, uh, 
I know my lawyer sort of made this suggestion that you either do the overlay in lieu or as well as uh, either one is appropriate apparently. Uh, so, but I think I think uh, those options have to be considered extremely carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Michelle. I would add that the ten percent is the starting point of what's uh, permitted. Going up to thirty percent by a special permit, uh, providing that the applicant can show that there is no adverse uh, impact on drainage. Of, of going larger. So if, if you have a small lot and you want to go greater than 10%, you can apply for a special permit to go up to 30%. So it doesn't outlie that or make it non-conforming. It just requires a special permit. Can I, can I address that comment, Mr. Chairman? Please go right ahead. Yeah. Um, the uh let me let me just think about that for a moment I, I i fully agree with the special permit process uh it's the unfairness on the small lot owners compared to the lot, large lot owners that i'm concerned about in other words if you can control the runoff from large lot owners more strictly than 10 percent then you can ease up on the small lot owners and not make them all non-conforming in both cases, I agree with special permits above a certain level. It's the unfairness to small lot owners that I'm concerned about. Uh, I, I, I agree with the special permit process, process. I think it's very good. But I, 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 the fact that there's large lot owners at the moment that can go build 8,800 square feet of, of impervious surface, that's unfair. So I think the two, uh, the two ideas have to go together and not pin all hopes on that special permit process and make the small lot owners essentially non-conforming except that they can go for a special permit. I, I agree that they're not non-conforming that they have to go to a variance. I agree with that and that's a good thing and I think that was a great idea. Um, so it's just that unfairness that I'm trying to think about and address and why I'm worried about just going for this blanket 10% on the small lot owners around the lake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. May, uh, may I say something, Mr. Chair? Um, uh, I'm right not, thank you. I'm not a hydrologist, but most, most of the small lots are on the lake or close to the lake. So saying that they can have they can have more impervious surface as a trade-off for somebody with a larger lot further from the lake, I'm not sure makes sense. Part of the problem with the small lots close to the lake is that they're close to the lake, so their water is going into the lake pretty quickly and not being filtered. I can answer that to some degree, Mr. Chairman, if you'd allow. I, I don't think there was a question, but uh, feel free to comment. Go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the experiences I had about, uh, I think it must be 30 years ago, there was a lot cleared uh, on North Road and, uh, and that created impervious surface. Trees were chopped down, reduced, reduced the ability of the land to soak up the water and so on. And that water, because it starts at the top of the hill, comes down extremely rapidly. Uh, erodes everything in its path if it's not controlled properly, and it's that it's that type of thing that we're trying to control with these large lots. These large lots are out at the top of the hills; they're not close to the lake. If you're close to the lake, the water doesn't get up enough steam to cause a big problem, unless it's coming from the top of the hill. So something coming from the top of the hill will come steaming down the lake across a small lot and straight into the lake and cause all sorts of trouble. So it's not really uh, a hydrology problem for the small lots close to the lake. The, high, the biggest problems we've had with runoff, and I've been, I've been at this lake 42 years, you understand. I've seen it all. The biggest problem with runoff is the lots at the top of the hills being cleared, houses put on, 
and the water coming down the streets. So the Birchwood Drive, when I first was a mess, when I first came, was a mess because of that. Campet Lane's a mess because of that now. Uh, it's, it's not the small lots that are close to the lake. There's a problem from a hydrology point of view. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, any further comment from the public? From the commissioners? Okay. I think I we got, got a lot that we can discuss when we go, go back to yes. our meeting. Yes, absolutely. So I am uh, looking for a motion to uh, approve, or excuse me, accept the uh, submission of the Lake District uh, regulations by planning and zoning uh, to be, uh, again, we're simply approving the application of the accepting the application I should say I keep making that mistake accepting the application do I have a motion uh, Janet so moved second second by Richard Williams Valerie yeah all those in favor aye aye aye, aye. those opposed aye. I'm sorry opposed no okay none Okay, so moved. So we have accepted for discussion at our meeting. Uh, thank you for the input, uh, Mr. Barry, uh, Ms. Trotta, uh, Mr. Michelle. We appreciate the input. We appreciate you taking the time. And again, you're more than welcome to uh, uh, stay for our meeting following the last hearing. So, thank you very much for letting us comment. I appreciate the time. Sure. Okay, the third item is, uh, again, the applicant being the Asher Planning and Zoning Commission, a proposed temporary moratorium, which is new Article 6N, Adult Use Cannabis, to enact a temporary six-month moratorium on cannabis establishments. Um, again, those establishments being of a retail sale nature. And we open up the hearing for... Um, Again, our moratorium, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, I don't think I have it right in front of me. Um, our moratorium was for six months, taking us to May 1st. Is that correct? It's it's for a maximum of six months. So maximum. from the date, from the date it's, it's effective uh, for a maximum of six months. So, okay, so we are now dealing with two, yeah, in that range, sometime April, May, June uh, for uh, a maximum of uh any uh any discussion or input from the public the only thing that i would just mention while the hearing is open is that this is a the hearing is to consider language for the temporary moratorium this is not so this just puts in place the moratorium so that the, the commission can consider regulations surrounding adult use cannabis. This does not make any decisions about how the town will deal with it um, or anything along those lines. It gives, gives us the breathing room because uh, under the current regulations and statutes, we would have to treat an application for, for any type of cannabis establishment like a similar use. Um, so, for example, retail, which is allowed in most of our commercial areas. So this just gives us breathing room to not have to deal with an application prematurely. And do we have recommended language that we that's been developed or what's our status on that? So um, there are some towns that have taking a crack at how they want to handle it. It's really a large disparity between what towns are doing. Some are saying like Enfield, for example, probably geographically the closest that I know of, just all out banned cannabis across the board. Some towns are saying, because there are tax incentives, so um, revenue, tax revenue generated by these establishments, a portion of that stays with the town. So some towns are saying, Hey, we want we want to have this. This is an opportunity for economic development, and so and there's everybody in between. So once you guys decide on the approach, we can probably come up with some language. But nothing has been officially provided by the state. Okay, 
All right. Thank you. Okay. Having no public comment, um, and the commission can speak freely when uh, we come together, uh, I think we'll move to uh, accept the application. Uh, if there's a motion to uh, accept the application for uh, development of language regarding uh, temporary moratorium, um, is there a motion? I'll move it. Janet. Janet. Janet motions. Second. There was a, there was a second. I'm sorry, I didn't see the second. Yep. Richard. Richard Williams seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those Aye. opposed? All those opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Okay. So that uh, with that we will close the uh, public hearings. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for your input and your attention to that. Uh, we now move into our meeting section. If I can just find my agenda here that I have. Bear with me. Here we go. Okay, so moving on to back into our meeting now, the uh, October 12th meeting for planning and zoning item number seven. Uh, unfinished business, the Seven Oak Drive special permit for short-term rental. Uh, and um, so, uh, input from the commissioners regarding the applicant's request for this short-term rental. Any input? Um, yeah, um, I appreciate all the effort she put into it and um, the thoughtfulness on it and con contacting the neighbors. Um, however, I don't I don't see a compelling reason why we should um, allow it when our regulations um, require uh, the uh, owner to be in re or someone to be in residence, the owner to be in residence. And that is specifically, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me and don't have it memorized. I'm, uh, the specific regulation said it requires the, uh, so, an owner or a someone to be in residence at that so, point, at that the site? Yes. Correct. Ar Article 4B, Section 4, Subsection 3 does require an owner to be in residence. So I, just jumping in, and granted, it's not my decision, but reading that language, it says if a short-term room rental occurs in the RA zone, I don't believe a room rental is what's being proposed here. I think that the okay. idea is that the entire structure. I read that to be a distinction. Um, granted, I'm not the commission, um, but uh, I, I think that there, there may be some intent to create a distinction between someone who's who's using the portion of the property uh, and or allowing the, the whole property to be rented. Um, talk to me about intent, Janet and Mark. I know you guys um, work the, on the, the intent. The intent was um, uh, for, for rental of the entire property. And the intent is that there are locations, not in Ashford, but there are locations where so where so many investors have bought up residential structures and used them as uh, Airbnbs that the the community is just lost. There's no longer a neighborhood. Um, so the requirement, the the idea was that somebody has to be living. Somebody has to be a resident in the home. Correct. And, you know, again, in Article 4B, Section 4, um, Section A, Subsection 1, you know, owner operator of a short term rental must obtain a zoning permit from the commission prior to offering their property for rental. A short term rentals are conducted on a temporary and periodic basis. 
no non-conforming use rights will be recognized for short-term rentals existing at the time of the passage of these regulations. So the um, the definition of a short-term rental is um, 28 days. Isn't that right, Mark? Yes. Um, you know, I would suggest that the owner consider, um, you know, if she needs if she needs to to um, raise the money, that she consider long-term rentals. There was also a concern around the lake that, in the lake areas, that um, short-term rental people would not be concerned with the, the quality of the water. Uh, Janet, uh, oh, is it, uh, there, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Richard. I'm, I'm looking at uh, Article A, uh, subsection 1, and it talks the application must include either the A in the case of lots in the IRA zone, the name of the property owner residing on the premise, or B in the case of lots outside the IRA zone, the name and contact information of a property manager who must live or work within two hours of the site and express written consent of the property owner for such temporary rental. So, so, so why do you differentiate those two cases there when you put the, the, that item together? Well, again, the, uh, the, the, um, one of the impetuses behind this, these regulations are to keep our communities as communities, to keep neighbors living next to neighbors instead of having, um, your next door, your, your building next door is really a business because it's short-term rentals. Um, and if you're in a residential district, that would be more important than if you're in a business district. So uh, the only other thing that I want to point out, and I'm, I'm not trying to, to push back or create that perspective, we have two definitions for short-term rentals. We have one which is rental unhosted and one which is rental hosted. Um, and if you look at the requirements of the section, you know, that are in there, it's an allowable use in the RA zone, which is, and the only reason I'm bringing this up is because in, in my participation in developing these regs and going through the process and advising the applicant in going through these requirements, making sure that she understood that these were the standards I, I do not recall at any point in time the commission feeling like an Airbnb would be would be occupied by the resident because we have bed and breakfast establishments which are in allowed use and separately ad addressed in the regs, um, which is why we included the one year permit renewal. We discussed whether we include the term nuisance um, and and that if we got complaints related to this or that, the commission would use that in their renewals. Um, if the commission thinks that uh, short-term rentals need to be occupied by the owner, then I think we should probably look at adjusting this language because that's, generally speaking, not what a short-term rental is. Yeah, Mike, I, that's what I was trying to allude to. Uh, uh, I don't recall the idea that a whole house would be rented with the idea that the owner would be uh, in residence of the whole house. Uh, this was to try to get a handle on what would be permitted in terms of short-term rental of a house. Um, and the idea is that it would be less than a month and it would be subject to all of the other requirements that are laid out here. So, um, and Mike, where are you getting those definitions? What, what page are those on? Those are in the definitions section, so it's page 25. We we define short-term rental, we define short-term rental hosted, and short-term rental unhosted. And that and the unhosted is where the 
piece of language that was re read, I think, by you, which talks about a designated agent within two hours of the property. That's where that language comes from. Hmm. Well, if you go, if you go on, um, Airbnb and look up places to rent, you know, there are a number of them that, that, um, uh, owners rent out rooms or small apartments in their buildings. Um, so there are a number of them that the owners are uh, on site. But again, that's, that's based on the fact that it is a, a single room or a portion of the home as opposed to the entire structure being uh, dealt with, being rented. Right. Yeah, and, but I, I'm going back to Mike and on page 25 of the revised regulations, we have the three things that are, are, are defined, short-term rental, short-term rental hosted, and short-term rental unhosted. And the unhosted, you know, talks about the agent being within two hours of the rental property and uh, it, it's to accommodate transient guests for no no more than three times during a six month period so uh, I, I i guess and i would ask mike that how we uh, ended up with the definitions here that seem to be somewhat in conflict with what's in the body of the regulation Right. I, yeah, I, I would have to go back and look. I, I don't even. It's been a long the, time. Uh, since the the definitions me. were in the body of the regulations, and Mike asked them to be removed to the definitions. Yeah, that was part of the, the formatting for the regulatory analysis when we did the codification. But as far as the actual drafting of the language, I would have to go back and look at the red lines. To, See yeah, I don't think the language was changed, uh, Mark. I, it was just, we wanted to put all the regu all the definitions in the definition section, and not uh, sprinkle them uh, in in the body of the regulations. The, yeah, I'm not saying the language was changed. I'm just saying that the language was was in the regulation, and it was re when it was removed into the definition section. Yeah. Any other uh, input from other commissioners? Well, I don't want to speak for Janet, but I think when we were drafting it, we were we were trying to avoid commercial use of a property. You know, the, the point of drafting the short-term rental was to allow a property owner the ability to, you know, to rent their property on a temporary basis, not as a permanent 12-month occupation. I do know in the letter from uh, Ms. Smirnos, her intent is to not, and you know, I know uh, the best of intentions, but I know her intent indicated to uh, return this, uh, to stop um, renting this uh, once she had achieved a certain level of financial stability and return it back to being her own second home. Um, obviously, intent. Uh, Who's to say how long that would take or how long that would be? But, I mean, uh, I, she I did give us her intent to, also. Sure, I was just speaking toward the regulation yep. and what we were looking at. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Speaking uh, from what our options are moving forward, you know, based on the fact that the hearing is closed, I mean, I think you you have two options since we can't get any more information from the applicant the the re, the language and i'm what i'm reading now and is is that they're talking about in the ra zone sh says shall be the primary residence of the owner 
you can, if you think the application doesn't meet the requirements, then you can deny the application. You can also approve the application subject to the requirements of the section. And if the applicant is not in compliance with one of those requirements, then that would be a violation of the permit. And um, it could either be subject to non-renewal or enforcement or whatever. Um, but, and I don't have the application in front of me because I got too much open. I don't know if she states if this can be the primary residence, entirely possible that this could be, be your primary residence. This is not an issue, um, but we can't ask her that. So we can either well, approve. She, she is here, Mike, and uh, she indicates that she's going to have the next door neighbor across the street watching over things, that she's got a security system. She can keep an eye on things. So she's not planning on being in residence. But I, I guess I'm confused a little bit here in the language in the definitions versus the language in the regulations. There seems to be a conflict there. Um, and I think that's a, a, a problem for us. It, yeah, you know, pr um, primary residence is, you know, the place you call home, but, um, residing on the property is a different, is something different. Um, you know, you can have a single home and you can travel for work on assignments and you could short-term rental use your house as a short-term rental while you are are working on, on a work project for a month here or there it's still your primary residence you're just not physically at the property and so there's a yeah i i agree that there's a bit of a distinction between are we concerned about it being the primary residence or that the person is physically there someone is physically there managing the rental while it is being rented because again i think that gets into a, an airbnb or a, sorry a bed and breakfast you know more traditional bed and breakfast establishment so i i think that there needs to be clarification language written well if we if we get into further splitting of hairs or anything on this too let's look at the fact that uh Ms. Marinos, her indication is that she goes in on a weekly basis for maintaining it what is what is considered the requirement for being on site is it 24 hours is it two hours a week i mean we don't have a true um uh, identification of that when it comes to hosted versus unhosted i only know of one case i think it was in windsor that dealt with a really long time ago uh residency based on a home occupation it was a vet who thought he who said he was living there and that's why he wanted to run his vet business there the town said he wasn't living there and and the judge pretty much said home is wherever he says home is, um, but I don't know, that's not widely applicable here, but the, you're correct. We, we don't really have a way to define a lot of that stuff. Well, it, do, it does say um, in the case of lots in the RA zone, the name of the property, oh, I'm sorry, I'm misreading it, Never mind. If name, we had maintained, I'm sorry, if, I'm sorry, what? Oh, I'm sorry, it, it is correct. It says the name of the property owner residing on the pre premises, premises. So it does require that the property owner be residing there. Yeah, but uh, the Jen, Jen, the section you're reading is the, uh, to uh, obtain the zoning permit. It, it's saying that, uh, the that the permit must have the the name of the of the uh, person living there, or in the case of lots outside, uh, you know the property manager. So that's not talking about whether the rental must have the person living there. It's well, sections. the intent, yes. the intent is that the person would be living if your owner is residing on the premises that that's where they're living. Yeah, your section three talks about the property must be the primary residence of the owner, but that gets back to the point of what 
Mike has commented on about the veterinarian. Mm -hmm. And and I come back to the conflicting statements about hosted and unhosted uh, in the definitions. And uh, when we went through this, when I looked in, in this in total, when when and I didn't go over this uh, section line by line because you folks took the the lead on it. But it was my understanding that this was really aimed at uh, regulating Airbnb type rentals as opposed to uh, prohibiting Airbnb type rental. Well, it's well, right, but an Airbnb is a short term rental, regardless of whether it was. You know, rent it off of Airbnb or whether you're advertising individually. It was, you know, it was to address weekly rental. Well, I'm thinking the commission seems quite torn on this, obviously. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we need to. Uh, in this case, I think we're limitation. Please don't go by what I necessarily say on this. This is just my personal um, thought process is that due to the constraints of what we've written as a regulation, um, in this case, I'm thinking that the application cannot be approved. However, what I would like to recommend is that we go back and come back to our next meeting with new suggested language um, that better defines and uh, separates the nature of a hosted and unhosted situation and try and get this changed to encompass better. I mean, we have a situation here. We weren't familiar with every situation that was gonna come up. We have a situation here that we need to address and I think our language being rewritten would better address that and ask the applicant to potentially reapply. And in this case, I would waive fees for any type of reapplication, obviously. Um, and uh, uh, again, I put that out to the group. Yeah, Jeff, I think that's reasonable. Mike, any time frames that we need to be aware of? Um, so based on where we are now, you can, you have 65 days to issue a decision. You can have another 65 days with extensions, which means you can hold a decision on this application for a total of 130 days. If we, if we worked in earnest to get something um, done, let's say we workshopped the language at the next meeting and, and then went through from there, it's plausible that you could get it done before you get to the point of having to issue a decision on this application. Okay. Um, the one thing that I don't know of, based on the fact that we've only had four people speak here, is if there's a consensus on the commission that would even warrant reviewing the regs because if the majority of the folks here don't actually want to change the regs then it wouldn't be worth the process so i would just want to make sure the commission has a consensus that it's worth the time but we can get it done okay um I, I, could i, I, I would, i'm sorry go I ahead turn, richard i turn that into a motion so we that's can just what forward. i was going to say could i could i have a motion regarding um the um uh consensus uh a motion that the uh, commission like to uh, re-review and potentially rewrite the current short-term rentals um, for uh, I, I don't know better include I don't know what, what help me yeah, out they, here Mike better inclusion yeah. of uh, multiple uh, requirements. Uh, 
something. I think, the, I think the words would be to better define hosted versus unhosted rentals. I'm fine with that. Is there a motion to that? I'll make the motion, Jeff. I'll make the motion. Oh, Doug Jenny made the motion, I believe. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yes. And the second on that was? Catherine. Catherine, thank you. Catherine. Um, yes. Uh, so, uh, all those in favor? And um, in this case, I'm going to take a poll of the um, uh, members just to be sure we capture it appropriately. Um, Richard? Aye. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Catherine? Aye. Alex? Aye. Mark? Aye. Jeff Schillinger? Jeff, on mute. Moving on. Doug? Aye. And Janet? Aye. Okay. And I don't usually put in my vote, but we'll put mine in. So, uh, Jeff Schillinger, one more time. Jeff, I'll open up the chat if you want to type it. He's having a problem. Let's see if he sends anything. Okay. All right. Anyways, um, we'll go with a, uh, in this case, a seven to zero to, I guess it would be a one, some type of an extension in this case. So, um, So to that end, uh, we will re-examine the uh, language in the uh, current uh, short term for next week. As for the application, uh, I would say that we table the application uh, until our next meeting. Um, and I don't think I don't think I do. I, I don't need a motion on that, do I, Michael? I would. All right. This okay. Can I have a motion? Yep. This is a bit Can I have a motion to table the current application from uh, Ms. Smirnoff's uh, regarding the uh, short-term rental? So moved, Alex. So moved by Alex. Second, Janet. Second, Second by Janet. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Abstentions? So moved. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we've dealt with that one. Um, and uh, Janet and Mark, um, since you are somewhat intimately involved, do you think you might be able to put your heads together and uh, take a look at that and draw in any assistance you might feel you need? Sure. Michael or Richard or any other member? Thank yep. you. It'd be great. It would be great to hit the ground running uh, for the next meeting. Yeah, and guys, get to me quickly rather than uh, otherwise, because I'm going to be out of pocket for a while. Uh, my operation presently is scheduled for the 29th. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and to that end, and Michael, uh, when you have the opportunity, should you have the opportunity to speak to uh, Ms. Smirnoff, again, please reiterate that uh, we are uh, working on this and that um, any type of reapplication uh, requirement, should it take place, um, will not, uh, the payment would be waived. But I think we're going to fall within, if we can fall, as you said, if we can work at this diligently and fall within the time frames, we shouldn't even have to worry about that. Okay, moving on to the next item, the Lake District regulations. Um, Again, those of you that uh, uh, took the time to review the piece from Robinson and Cole um, regarding uh, the uh, lots in question, um, 
I'll deal with a couple of things, and I'll be very, very honest. This is Mike making me sound very smart, okay? Um, first item is the regulations do not go far enough in protecting water quality. Um, well, the current regs right now do not at all deal with water quality. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is our first foray. This is our first step towards trying to deal with the areas in and around the lake. Um, and it was developed um, to uh, work with uh, projects in and around the lake that can become burdensome for the property owners due to the fact of lack of regulations, lack of zoning regulations to follow. Um, there are certain areas that they talk about. Um, the Lake Association could develop their own private property restrictions uh, if it should be addressed uh, that uh, should be addressed beyond local zoning that again do not fall within our purview. Some of their roads, um, those couple of few of the roads they mentioned are town roads. And I have started some discussions with um, the selectmen and uh, public works regarding the, uh, especially the Campert Lane running down and the runoff from there and what's been proposed in the past or what's been looked at. Um, as for the overlay, um, the problem is with the overlay is that it starts to, it basically changes the zoning of areas in and outside the Lake Districts. I mean, Lakewood, uh, Lakewood Lane, North Road, those all fall currently under the RA zone requirements. Um, and though a long range plan, it might be a good long range plan for us to develop, um, it becomes, if we just do the overlay um, on those, they become more restrictive to those larger uh, conforming lots. And uh, we can't make it less restrictive and still apply the Lake District rules. Or as Michael was saying, it's probably two different movements. It's the uh, zoning regulations and then it's the overlay regarding the uh, watershed itself. Yeah, Jeff, I would also add that we're talking about the Lake Districts here, but we have quite a few bodies of water and rivers and streams. Uh, the Mount Hope comes to mind in that uh, there's been quite a bit of work done uh, on the Mount Hope to uh, eliminate some of the runoff was going into the Mount Hope. So uh, what we would talk about doing in and around Ashford Lake could have implications to a number of properties all th all throughout the town. So I it, I would you know be hesitant to just jump in on that with you know uh, without thinking about the uh, bigger uh, implication. And you're very true. You're very right, Richard. It would be a, a bigger picture for us to do this. Um, and I think and I think would delay some uh, excellent planning and some excellent work and some excellent effect on the current lake districts to start getting them into the mix of uh, you know the water runoff and uh, just not allowing for um, helter-skelter uncontrolled um, development in areas that are uh, you know right on the waterway and as for um, the um, the development or the runoff from larger areas well Larger areas are always going to, in a, a large runoff, are always going to, from the top of the mountain coming down uh, to the front area. But I think the front area of the lakes have a more uh, direct effect uh, on a daily or um, uh, more frequent basis of rain that isn't torrential and rain that doesn't cause a huge runoff. But um, it also has a uh, again when you total up all of the areas it does have quite a large direct effect and I think some of the runoff we see coming down from uh, properties a distance away and going through all the filtering and all too except for areas uh, times of large runoff which we've experienced this year which are kind of unprecedented also um, Further input on that, the first issue? Yeah, Jeff, I'd break into uh, uh, three or maybe four areas that they're making. Uh, to talk about improving the water quality in general, I think that's beyond our, our scope of what we can do with these regulations. But uh, 
tackling the easiest thing first, uh, his desire to uh, have by special permit a uh, an articulated you know solar uh, f uh, facility, uh, including that as a special permit, uh, as long as with, with the idea that w we would make sure it didn't obstruct anyone's views, because that would be part of the per permitting process. I don't see that as as a problem uh, insert in that. Uh, going into the uh, definition of what would be done to increase the impervious area, uh, I had sent to uh, Mike, uh, you, Jeff, uh, Alex, uh, a email that summarized what had gone on in Coventry Lake, and I also included the language that Coventry Lake used to increase their impervious area from 10% up to 30%. I, and I would suggest that some of that language, which is uh, speaks to the kinds of things that should be done to evaluate whether that would be feasible, should probably be added into our regulation. And uh, I didn't see that going in, but it, that would at least give an idea of what would be required. And then the last item is the idea of a uh, having a small lot versus larger lot. Uh, I'm not sure that you really accomplished much there because we've got the, uh, you know, the 10% up to 30% and saying that we would not allow the large lot to go any more than 20%. I don't think that really uh, uh, does anything to prohibit the large lots that we were talking about early with, with the runoff. So I, I don't see that as something that I, I would recommend change, changing. So just um, kind of in, in summary, yes for special permit for the solar, no for d d differentiating the large lot for a small lot, uh, and three, putting an example of what needs to be done in terms of the technical submission of going from the 10% up to the 30%. And I would use the language from Coventry as a starting point. Okay, um, thank you for that, Dick. I, I am in agreement with you regarding the um, uh, lot sizes and the uh, tiered uh, methodology when we do have a process in place for allowing uh, a lot to show that it uh, is meets the requirements or that it's acceptable to allow for uh, a larger uh, lot coverage um, based on what's on that lot of any size. Um, when it comes to the solar uh, array, um, I guess a couple of things that come to mind for me, and uh, again, I've had some discussions with Mike on this. Um, in the language, in the in the suggested language that's offered, one of the things is that there will be no adverse impact on adjacent lot owners and poles will not unreasonably block. Well, that gets into the issue of the, um, uh, you know, moving away from language that is open to interpretation. Um, and both of those statements really are open to, in the eye of the beholder, really, uh, for interpretation. The other issue is that you think, you think about it, you've got this, you've got this maximum height tower now of 25 feet. Um, if it were to um, uh, one of the limitations we have on a lot of our uh, structures, uh, our height structures, has to do with where it would fall in relation to a lot. Now, again, if it's on a two acre lot, something that high is not going to impede or fall into a proper across a property line. But when you're talking uh, properties that are 30, 40, 50 feet wide, and you've got a 35 foot tower, um, that tower could potentially fall onto someone else's property. Um, it has that potential to reach across depending on where it is. Even if it's smack dab in the middle of a certain lot, it could still reach across that setback into someone's lot, into someone else's lot. So um, I'm hesitant to allow for a variance of some type or a special permitting of something that large in an area that is that constrained um, with lot size and 
house upon house, house behind house, um, and all the issues that might affect a property owner's uh, property value. Yeah, Jeff, uh, I, I would go along with what you're saying uh, in that I, he's got a lot of subjective things in his language. Uh, I would include the subjective item, but if it's by special permit, the commission could evaluate things like the fault uh, uh, zone, uh, w whether or not it is uh, uh, block someone or doesn't block some someone or would block someone from f future development. There could be a lot of those things that the commission could consider upon making that determination. And it would not be a good idea to put, you know, such as things in the language as he's done. Um, I, I, I can see I can see the special I can see the special permit working. Janet, you were going to say. Oh, I, I was going to mention on a small lot the um, it might cast a shadow as well um, on on neighbors' property at different times of day. Um, I'm not I'm not sure. I I'm totally in favor of solar, but I'm not sure why we would make an ex a height exception for solar, and then someone would say, well. But I want my house to be that tall. Why can't my house be that tall? Right, because I'm going to make my house 35 feet and put solar panels on it. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, I think the only rationale for that would be when you are in a smaller lot area like you are around the Ash Ashford Lake, you really don't have the uh, ground area or the roof area necessarily to put much solar up. So the idea of the articulated solar is is more applicable where your your uh, footprint constraint. But uh, yeah, you know, exceptions to the height as by special permit, uh, singling out solar as opposed, you know, I'm surprised someone didn't suggest we have a, a wind turbine on there too. Because <laughs> uh, we, we could put a wind turbine up uh, on on the lake, and, and uh, that could, that would be up uh, much higher than than 35 feet. So I'm not, I'm yeah I'm not I don't think I'm in favor of the special permit for solar. I I, I don't think I've heard a compelling reason for it. Um, is is there is there a current height requirement by the Lake Association also? What did you say? Is there a lake association requirement on any of this um, development? Not that, not that I don't think so. Okay. The problem with, you know, the problem, the lake association, well, I know Ashford Lake has a covenant and in order to change it, you have to go into the deed of every lake association member and change right. the deed. So right. the covenants, I think it still says you can't hang laundry out on Sundays. Um, <laughs> It's never changed. And I know, um, I don't know if anyone here is from Lake Chafee. Lake Chafee has to go to the state legislature to get its, um, to increase its dues. I'm not sure what they have to do to change their rules and regulations, but I wouldn't expect either lake to be changing them. Interesting. And Janet, how many solar installations like what he has are, are in, uh, in Ashford Lake? He's got the only, He's got the only poll. And his, his concern about the non-conforming, uh, in the general language of the RA zone, uh, we grandfather in all non-conforming. So if he's non-conforming according to the current regulation with his solar, it's still there and it's still going to be grandfathered in. And the same goes for the amount of impervious that uh, he is exceeding the 10% already that would also be grandfathered in he would have right. to though go in for a special permit if he wanted to put in a shed that would increase the amount of impervious i wanted to ask mike um where where the 10 percent came from um i think that we used that as a baseline um from our review of some of the other regulations and then in also looking at the average home and lot size in those areas i think actually um jeff did a did a graphic 
that he shared with the commission, if I'm remembering correctly, which yes. showed the, the various components. Um, and we had bounced around on that number um, because, you know, at some point, someone who wants to put in a 10 by 10 shed is going to have to demonstrate what their coverage is and then what they're going to. Um, and they're going to get caught up in that. Um, yeah, Mike, the uh, email that I sent to you, and I think that email was shared with the commission, and the email is dated uh, uh, Saturday, January the 6th of this past year. Um, and that uh, lists the rationale for the 10%. It, uh, uh, I had gone around and looked at the average lot size on Lake Chafee and the, the size of the houses that were on Lake Chafee. And the 10% pretty much uh, applied for most of what's existing built. Uh, and then, uh, right, then came up with the fact that Ashford Lake was in generally much larger than the late Chafee lots. So therefore they would be, you know, uh, well within that 10%. I also should add another thing that I kind of stumbled across looking at some properties. There are a number of properties on Lake Chafee where houses are built on two or three lots, not just one. So uh, I don't know how prevalent that is. I didn't try to do a count, but it, it, it definitely, especially some of the lots that are uh, back away from the uh, lakefront, there's a lot of houses that uh, span two, two lots. Well, there's a lot on Ashford Lake, including mine, that do that as well. My other question is um, to Mike is, if somebody does want to put that 10 by 10 shed on, what what's the criteria for saying that the wastewater is being handled and treated? So if they want to put the shed in and let's say they're, they're at 11% and they, put, so they want to add a 10 by 10 garden shed, then that's going to trigger the special permit. So they're going to have to come to you and they're going to have to be able to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the commission based on the language that it references. I can pull it up. Uh, I'll get it. That um, when it's been demonstrated that such design is in accordance with subsection five of this article, which is existing language in our regulations about drainage. Um, the reason why we're putting that somewhat gray um, language about to the satisfaction of the commission is that there are um, varying degrees of practicality to doing certain things based on the size of the lot, the topography of the lot, soil, septic. You know, it's not one size fits all. And so we want to make sure that it's practicable, that they are not doing things that's overly onerous. But this is going to create a this is going to create an, a, a, a definite increase in engineering costs because that that 10 by 10 shed which is maybe only costing them you know not much money or that they're going to build themselves they're going to need an engineer they're going to have to do some design to show that the the area of the roof, which is going to generate X amount of water, is somehow being captured on their property. Um, that could be a rain garden. It could be, you know, groundwater infiltration. Um, you know, there's a number of different methods, but somebody's going to have to professionally design that. Um, but there needs to be some flexibility because having worked with LIDs type regulations in other towns, there's certain things that just from an engineering perspective aren't practical based on the components of the lot. So that was one of the issues brought up at the Ashford Lake board meeting um, when they discussed this was um, you're, you're imposing, you know, high engineer costs on people who want to make changes whether they're small or big um 
I, I don't know how I feel about that. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure we want to impose that on people, but then how do we um, make sure that they're handling the water correctly? So the, you know, I was thinking about this because I, I, based on you know the comments that you had relayed about what the Lake District felt and thinking about what we can do. Yeah, the, the problem is when do you stop? Um, because for example, we could add language which said the first 250 feet for any property which exceeds 10% as of the effective date of the regulations, you know, the first 250 square feet of impervious coverage is hereby exempt from subsection five, which means if you're at 11%, 12, 13, 14, 15, 29%, you can still add a small detached garden shed and not have to do any engineering. The, but we have to create some trigger, some stop point so that they don't just say, I'm going to do a little shed. Oh, I'm going to add a garage. Oh, you know, we, so that it doesn't force them to do it incrementally. Um, so, you know, we can certainly, I, I mean, I can certainly look into something along those lines if the commission, you know, because, yeah, the engineering costs associated with, a, a small shed are going to be at least equal to, but likely double what the cost of that shed is going to ultimately be. But yeah, we won't get there if we don't start somewhere as I think your other point. Are there, um, I don't know, are there, are there best practices, recommendations that could be used instead? Yeah. So like, if you're adding a 200 square foot shed, we're going to require that you create 100 square feet of rain garden. Um, like that, right. So rather than rather than us asking them to hire someone to engineer the solution, we perhaps come up with with pre-approved solutions that they can sort of implement. Um, well, at least for smaller projects, like you say, if, if somebody wants to put on a shed, I don't want to make it prohibitively expensive. If they're going to add a three-car garage, well, yeah, that would be something different, or even a garage, maybe. But well, the, um, the way to do that um, would be to uh, create a, a minimum. So the town that I was in, granted it was a Hartford County town, totally different from Ashford, but we had a square footage requirement. So it needed to be a project which which was in excess of 400 or 600 square feet of a new impervious coverage to trigger the LID requirements. So if you did 400 square feet, you were fine, but we also had a look back period so you couldn't do 300 square feet now, 300 square feet next year and skip it. Um, so you could do that. Um, and then those small, small projects would be exempt. Um, it's an option too. Yeah, Mike, uh, I just sent you the, the uh, email that I, had sent to you on the uh, in January of this past year. It includes the attachment of the Covenant regulations, which also describe what's required to get approval to expand the impervious area. So you might want to look at that and and send it out to, to the entire distribution. I don't have a distribution for the uh, all the planning and zoning. Otherwise, I'd have sent it out to them. Uh, but if you send that out to everyone, that at least will give an idea of where I, I was coming from. Yeah, I think it was in one of the meeting folders, but if not, I can resend it. So if I try to summarize where we've ended up, uh, 
for Jeff's comment and Janet's comment, uh, we're pretty much not in favor of making a special uh, permit for solar as a standalone. So that goes off the table. Uh, we're not in favor of having a big lot, small lot, uh, different criteria for impervious zones. We leave in, in place what we have. And yeah, and, and again on that, not at the, I think time, I think as Michael was saying that we, we need to start somewhere. Um, we can always, um, after a period of time, and see what we have for applications coming through or special permit requests and all too, if it starts to become uh, a large burden uh, based on what people are trying to do in their lots, then we can always look at that language and make changes to that language going forward. But we need a place to start, and it's better to start on a conservative nature as opposed to just wild, wild west and opening it up to large percentages. And I think of the gentleman's concerns that his property is going to be non-conforming. Uh, Mike, I think you need to explain to him the grandfathering and the fact that his uh, solar uh, system is already installed. No one's going to make him to tear it down. It, it, it's there and it's going to be grandfathered in. Uh, as far as him wanting to... Uh, increase the impervious area on his smaller lot. Uh, he can do that, but it will require a special permit. And I think if you try to use some of the language that was in the Coventry regulation, that might give an idea of a less restrictive uh, uh, way to get the approval without uh, hiring, uh, you know, you know, two or three town engineers, you know, to do an application. And then lastly, I think we've agreed that uh, opening up the can of words for a large lot overlay concerning water quality is something that we don't want to go there with this regulation. Did I capture everything? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, on I found on the um, plan of conservation and development, page 51 has the hydrology map. I don't know how accurate it is. But both Ashford Lake and Lake Chafee have pretty small footprints for their um, uh, drainage basins, which is interesting. Um, I think I like Jeff's idea that maybe an overlay would be a long, long-range plan to look at. Um, I would like. But you were would, saying basically, in looking at the map or the, the, that current hydrology map, good or bad. You were saying that it doesn't look like its footprint goes out much beyond the um, the lakes themselves. Yeah, they're pretty small. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. It's page fifty-one. Yep. Um, I would I I would um, prefer not to uh, endorse this un until we make some modification to help. People avoid this and these high engineering engineering costs for small projects. Okay, so uh, was that a motion that you made? Yeah, that's a be suggestion. A motion. That's a motion. That's a motion. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, if you could just repeat the gist of what you were saying regarding. Uh, um, I'm I move that we. Do not endorse the Lake District um, regulations until we uh, dis further discuss um, how to allow modify and to modify and discuss the uh, recommendations that uh, were just made, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Um, recommendations on I should be a little more specific. The resi the based on the recommendations regarding um, well you know what are we taking on here what are we saying well the recommend uh, recommendations based on um, increasing impervious um, uh, what do I say uh, impervious coverage impervious coverage.
increasing previous coverage um, for small structures. Hey, Jeff? Without triggering it yes. and engineering costs. Uh, no, I, I don't think that we should be making a motion like that. We should make a, either a motion to, uh, to pass what we have or not pass instead of uh, putting too many options on that because we're changing the whole agenda by, by doing that. At this point, I think you guys just need to make a motion to continue the public hearing, and I will do my darndest to prepare some language that I think is reflective of all of your discussion so you can consider that text. So as long as the hearing remains open, you can consider those changes um, related to the impervious coverage and how we're going to handle what we're dealing with so i can i have some thoughts on how we can do it and so i can um try to pull something together for the next meeting if you want to leave the hearing open okay all right and and we will, we, we, jeff we didn't close the public hearing now did we yes no, we, we yes we did yeah mike i would encourage you to go in and read the coventry regulation that's something that has uh, been in place for 20 25 years so uh, it's apparently it's it, it's uh, stood the, the test of time enough for everyone around Coventry Lake to abide by it. Uh, and I'm a little bit leery about trying to come up with special cases for if someone wants to put a shed on their property, they don't have to have a full engineering assessment to uh, increase the, the impervious zone. You know, if you're going to increase it, it's a special permit. And you're going to have to make a case in the special permit. I don't think we can uh, not allow increase in up, up to the 30 percent, uh, especially low in the, the small lots. So I mean, uh, it, it's just as a special permit. Maybe we need to better define what's going to be required of getting the special permit. Uh, but I, I don't see us coming up with a, a special case for a shed versus a deck versus a you know, a driveway or what have you, that would be too many, you know, uh, d details. Well, Mike, Mike just said that they would need an engineering report to add a small shed. So I think you could come up with a square footage that somebody could add. They'd still have to show you what they're going to do about the drainage, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be engineered. Or we could come up with some recommendations. Um, and I, I circle back to, this is addressed in about one paragraph of, of verbiage in the Coventry uh, Lake regulations. So I would encourage Mike, go back, look at that, see how does that play with what Janet's saying and see if we can start moving this thing forward. And, and just going back to what Alex had said, yes, we did close the public hearing. You are correct. So we're not keep, we're not extending the public hearing, Mike. We're extending our uh, uh, deliberation to vote on this. Right. You you can um, you can adopt any change that's non-material or more restrictive following the close of the hearing so as long as you're not saying well we were going to regulate you know 10 percent coverage and now we're going to go to five percent coverage um or 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 sorry 20 percent coverage you're good um but so you can't dial the regs back but you can make non-material changes or make the regs more restrictive i'm, I'm looking at your your email now dick and and um, some of the stuff that's in our regs is verbatim. I think we took it right out of there. So, but if you go into the uh, attachment, which is the Coventry regulation, right? That's what it, I'm looking at. I've got too many windows open here, but uh, it's, it's it talked about uh, being able to demonstrate that one inch rainfall would would not cause uh, something else. I, I don't have this thing in in front of me. Um, yeah, so the other thing is, 
that their regulation, I think this is another reason why we couldn't go, that they have recommendations that can be made by the town engineer, which we don't have. <laughs> um, but I'm wondering if, if perhaps we can just create some type of um, workflow for them to demonstrate some of this stuff that's kind of outside the regulations, almost like a manual um, that's not listed within the regs. But uh, we obviously can't do that on the fly right now. No. I, what we have currently in there doesn't really say what they need to do specifically to get the special permit to go from 10% to 30%. So I, I think we need to give some uh, indication, and that would not be a make the thing more restrictive it would be a non-material change to, to th this regulation and i think everything else that we discussed the solar the uh, large lot small lot all of those things we've agreed not to do those so that puts us just adding a paragraph or so as to what you need to do to uh, get the uh, special permit approved So Mike, can you take the actions to try to come up with that paragraph? I can, yeah. I think if we if we're just additionally clarifying what they what someone needs to do, I would say that's probably not a le less restrictive change. But the re the hearing is closed, so um, you know. Okay, hearing's closed. Our discussion's ongoing. What we're trying to do is get to the point whether we would vote to accept this new regulation or not. And I'm proposing that we would vote to accept it contingent upon you putting together the guidelines of what would be required to get the increase in impervious area, such that it would not be owners. I, I would say until we see what it is. Yeah, 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 we obviously see what it is, but again, trying to move forward on this. I mean, we've we've done this in the past, obviously. On, and um, if we don't if we don't like the contingency, then we can, you know, vote it down, so to speak, with the time frames we have. Um, uh, give me. <laughs> Give me till the next meeting to kind of digest where we are and what we want to go. I have a bunch of different things that I've written down for how we might be able to handle this. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of literature and guidance and, and documents and resources around. And there may be something that we can point to and simply say in accordance with or, or in consultation with and point to another guidance document. Um, so that give me give me till the next meeting so just don't issue anything now make no decisions and then where we are at the next meeting based on where the commission lands we can determine if we're if we need to re-advertise and just reopen the hearing or if we're good but i want you to well to, we, we would need we we would need to basically have another hearing correct because we've closed the hearing Right. So let's say after the next meeting, you review it and you guys say, you know what, we want to dial this back and go back to the less restrictive. Then I'm going to just sub put another legal notice in the paper and we'll hold another hearing on the revised regs. Um, so so we don't we don't need to have a motion or anything on this or a vote at this point. We can simply keep it under unfinished business, continuing our discussion for next time. Exactly. And where we end up at the next meeting will determine whether we can approve with modifications or have another hearing or right. we all can go to Las based Vegas. On, and give up. And Mike, based, on, based on the nature of the modifications, correct. Yeah. And and Mike, if, you're, if your modification is basically clarifying what you need to do to get past the special permit, I would say that that is, doesn't fall into the case of materially changing what has been put to the last public hearing. We should, you should right. be able to vote on it. I agree. Um, 
Yeah, the one question is if you guys, you know, if the commission wants to dial back, you know, not requiring a 10 by 10 shed to develop an engineering report or something along those lines, that's the only piece that I, we would need to clarify. Um, if we, well, we if, 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 you know, I would say something as specific as that would be foolish. <laughs> You know, well, yeah, 10, 10 yeah. 10. you know, there's there's a lot of, of small homes on these lakes. There's a lot of people that have lived here a long time. There's a lot of people who don't have a lot of money. They might want to put up a little shed. And I think it's 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 really onerous to say you have to I didn't realize when we were doing these that you have to get an engineer report to put up a shed. I mean, a lot of these homes don't have basements. Um, you know, you, you need you need storage. I think I think it's reasonable to come up with some small square footage that somebody could do without having to hire an engineer. Whether it's it's a shed or a small deck or you know whatever it is. Um, I I just I just think uh, otherwise it's it's a really I think it's too onerous on on the homeowners. Yeah, and, and Janet, I think we're agreeing, but in in uh, nomenclature, I'm saying don't put in a 10 by 10 shed or something like that. Describe the process where you can get the approval without requiring an engineer's professional report. That's that's the charge to Mike, is to come up with a simple process that you can get the approval. But I think there's going to be a difference between putting in a, you know, 10 by 10 shed and putting in a, an addition to your house that's going to, you know, increase it by 30%. So, you know, one size doesn't fit all is the, is the problem. Mike, do you think you can come up with something that meets everyone's concerns here? <laughs> I can come up with something, something that meets everybody's concerns. I don't know, um, but I have a bunch of different ideas that I, I want to hunt down, and, and I, I think I can I think I can get pretty close. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Mike. Um, the last item we have, and I knew it was going to be a long night, is the language regarding the um, cannabis moratorium on retail sales in uh, temporary moratorium. Um, Mike, God, I don't want to put this on you again. Do you have uh, some suggested language you could send to... Um, uh, a couple of the uh, commissioners to look at and work with. So, if the the language that is for consideration tonight is set in place, so if this gets approved, then yeah, I think once we get through some of these other amendments that are, you know, once we deal with that, I can pull together. What we can do is have a discussion, a commission discussion for what the approach is, and then I can draft some language for consideration. There's, there is some. Okay. There are some some good examples that I think we can use, and I think okay, we can do so, it. So for the discussion right now, um, uh, the likelihood is we're not going to be generating town taxes. Right, but the but the state licensing process is not even in place yet. So for some of those larger facilities, if we got this developed in the next six months. You're not really going to see many, many applications anyways, because the state licensing process has not yet been developed. I, well, I did, wasn't there something regarding um, areas and certain towns and things like this? And I think we qualified for all of one if, 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 if anyone was ever interested. Right. So we are for certain for the, the micro cultivator and retail, we are capped at one because we're less than 25,000 people. Um, but that's only until 2024, and then the state is going to remove the cap. The idea, okay. the, the purpose of the moratorium is that 
there is some concern that someone could come in and submit an application to us and say, I want approval to operate. I'm going to buy Dollar General and I'm going to, I'm going to do cannabis retail there. Right now, our regulations say retail is allowed use. And so we would have to allow it because we don't have regulations that deal with it. So they'd get their local approval and then sit on it while they go through and wait for the state process to happen. So this prevents someone from trying to get their foot in the door before we have regulations and then go to the state as a second step. Um, but it's going to be a significant number of months before you see any of these operations really get up and running because the state process hasn't been hammered out. Right, right. But what I'm talking about now is, you know, you were saying it'd be good to have some direction on language that the uh, commission wants to go in. Right. Um, so, yep, that'd be for a, adopting regulations that will replace the the moratorium regulation. Yeah, oh, I, I think what's oh, okay. what's in what's on the table now is simply agreeing that we put in a six month moratorium. And Mike's got some sample language of what some other towns have done similar to that that we could use. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. So it, it is, it's a much bigger discussion to decide what we would want to do long term. And I really doubt we're going to figure that one out tonight. But, right, uh, right. Yeah, the, but as far as the retail side of things, all you need to do is drive on the highway from uh, Tolland to Massachusetts and count the number of billboards advertising, you know, pot sales. We, we don't have to worry about it being sold in Ashford. They've they've, they've got the market cornered up in Sturbridge. <laughs> been by I, that I guess, place on my way. Been, been by that place on my way to Broomfield, actually. Um, so had, they actually had a uh, they actually had a um, a vendor. They had a, a booth at Brimfield, uh, yeah. that, that supplier. Anyway, well, you know, please, um, the, the one so that are we looking that, towards, I'm sorry, go ahead, Richard. I, I'm just a wise ass comment. It, it's, it's right across yeah. the street from Yankee Spirits. So you can Yankee buy, Spirits, your, yeah. buy your booze and your, and your pot right, right across each other. There's a new sign, Yankee Spirits and weed. Um, <laughs> if I could just add so, the, the language that's written in the, that was submitted for review and to for hearing and was that it says while the moratorium is in effect the commission will undertake a planning process to evaluate the potential impacts of allowing these establishments and consider any draft regulatory language provided by the department of consumer protection with the ultimate goal of adopting a new zoning regulation which addresses these uses in a manner which is suitable to the town of ashford so that's what we will do and we got six months to do it okay so uh, so we're looking for a motion to approve that language as uh, you just defined to us. I can share my screen if you want to look at it, but yep. Approve okay. the... That sounded pretty good, Mike. Take a look. Okay. Here we go. So there's three sections. I don't know how big it is. Um, so there's the purpose statement, which outlines that the law changed. And um, then there's a definition of terms, which basically says that we are going to define um, cannabis establishments as defined in the public act in the bill that was passed. And then the temporary moratorium, which is in effect for six months. Um, and the section that I read to you is that last line there. Um, so, so basically, this is a proposed Article 6N. So it, once you approve this, it will go into um, the zoning regs as a section. And then when you adopt regulations, the Article 6N will become the new section related to um, the regulation of cannabis, cannabis establishments. So. Um, this is this is what you are voting on to approve section one, two, and three. Okay, I've got it pulled up. It looks fine, Mike. Uh, move that we approve it. 
and we're moving to approve uh, the language of section Article 6N, temporary moratorium on cannabis establishments as written. Exactly. Correct. I'm, I'm doing that kind of for Valerie's uh, sake. So, yeah. But I know she Article, works well with Mike. So. Yeah, Article 6N consistent of section one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? Or did Richard, you already made a motion? I made the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Alex seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Okay, we come to some people's favorite point of the meeting. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Zoning officer's report. Yeah. Uh, short term rental. Okay, application included. Okay, public hearing. Um, yeah, Sony officer's report. What do you have, Mike? Anything? Um, nothing to report other than I, I got an email and I'm happy to send it on to anybody who's interested um, from, um, there's gonna be basically a housing forum and this is not related to anything that we're doing with the affordable housing grant, um, but there's going to be a housing forum coming up for Wyndham, for the Wyndham region. Um, and uh, they were asked that I provide it to you all, but it went out after the packet. Uh, it's the second section of the forum. It was a, there was originally one in the spring, I believe. It's um, it's called creating affordable housing in your community. Um, it's in a, about a week, and it's by the Wyndham Region Interfaith Working Group. Um, so there's limited registration. So if anybody's interested, I can send you the registration information um, and uh, for what that's worth. Other than that working on all these applications and, and just the processing of the administrative zoning permits. Um, we had the one enforcement item, which I brought to the commission two meetings ago that we voted to submit to town council. So that was submitted and they were issued a notice from the town attorney. Um, so that has moved, moved forward. Um, so we're just uh, humming right along and we, we um, executed the final, that was the other thing I finished up. We executed the final documents for the affordable housing plan. So the notice of grant award, the, the resolution by the board of selectmen and the certified budget information was all executed, endorsed and sent back to the department of housing. Um, so we got that part all wrapped up as well. Mike, this was a follow-up on a action item you had at the last meeting. I did read the meeting. You were going to look into what was going on with Cumberland Farms, if there was any issue there or not. Um, so I talked with Lynette. Um, they are having some issue with their system. I don't know what part of the system it is, um, whether it was the septic or a grease trap or, or drainage or what, but so the what they were doing was pumping, having someone come and do a pump and haul to get it off site. Um, and then they were working with their engineers to figure out what was going on. It, it may, I don't know um, exactly what the issue is there, but like I said, Lynette was aware of it. So uh, I'm assuming Eastern Highlands has involvement if it's in fact related to the septic or for anything along those lines okay. and then one other quick item the uh building that partially burned down across the street from the fire station has there been mm -hmm. any any activity on that uh, from a zoning perspective you know i don't really have anything that i can do because there's nobody on the property and there's no you know violations at least that i that i've been able to see the building department had issued notices to them, which is what resulted in the fencing. But I don't think that we have any real regulatory power to do much more there. Yeah. Unfortunately. Is there anything from a health department standpoint or anything like that? That, uh... I, you know, from a public health perspective, 
uh, you'd have to be able to show that there was something going on there that created a, like I said, a public health risk. Um, I, I don't know, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a, a bit of a, a reach, but it would be up to Lynette to determine if there was anything there. Um, and you said no one's on site, no one's on property at this point. No. Yeah. Uh, Mike, it was before my involvement in the, the town uh, activities, uh, but there used to be a, a fellow that was somewhat of a pack rat hermit that lived uh, uh, on 89, uh, and he had just all sorts of junk, and I believe it was the Board of Selectmen that eventually moved to get his property condemned, and they moved everything off the property. I don't know, Jeff, do you recall anything about that? Yeah, I, I know the gentleman you're talking about, the uh, the sign, butchers, thieves, and uh, robbers and thieves, whatever it was from, uh, I believe it was John Wolf. Um, and that was probably in uh, John Zulick's time, if I remember right. Um, and as to what made that move forward, I don't have a clue uh, at this point, but I'm sure there's... I know there's someone probably in the office that can spread some light on that. So I'll check with the selectman's office. I would have to think that Folletti and or uh, Ralph Fletcher would uh, know the history there. Or even, I'm thinking more of the resident historian, Chris Abikoff also. Yeah. Okay. All right, anything else, Michael? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all your efforts. Uh, thank you for what you've provided to us uh, to keep us aware of uh, what's coming into your office. And um, uh, let's talk a little bit more about some of this stuff. And uh, please reach out if you're looking for guidance as to from a commission standpoint of where we might or might not want to go on something. Uh, with that being said, I have a motion for adjournment. So moved. Janet. Janet moved. Seconded. Second, Second by Richard Williams. All those in favor? I'm sure you don't have to ask for that. And Aye. 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 Thank you all. Amen. Thank you for your attention again. We knew it was going to be a long night. We paid the penalty from uh, last month's being. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you. Take care, everyone. See you on a month.